All right, guys, in this lab, what you're going to end up doing is you're going to end up doing a simulation of harmonic motion. So <clears throat> the first part is the spring part. And essentially what you want to do is you want to go to the FET website. And if you type in FET masses and springs on your search engine, more than likely it's going to be um, one of the, if not the first result looks like this all right so let me hit play so that you can see what we want to look at here um you know there's a few options here so this is probably why it's a good idea to make this video now uh just go to the lab part um and what you see is you have a spring here you've got weights you can hang off of it you have the ability to um change the weight that's on the spring here and essentially what we want to do is we want to do kind of what we did in lab when we first investigated springs hang it off but you want it to stop moving if you actually increase the damping it'll happen a little bit quicker but you can see it happens pretty quickly here on its own and what you can do is you can measure what its displacement is from equilibrium just like we did in lab so if I put the ruler here and I kind of hang the mass down there. Let me just get it to the stop real quick with the damping. Uh, and then if you take a look, I know what my weight is, right? It's 100 grams or 0.1 kilograms. And that means that in my lab, I can get my weight, right? So we know the mass in kilograms. The hanging weight force would be this times 9.81. So if this was 0 0.100 kilograms, this would be 0 0.981 newtons. And then you can hang off some different weights. Um, I think I give you suggestions of what to do, but you can choose which weights to do. Um, might be as simple as increasing this to, you know, like something like 200. You can see it goes down further. So essentially, you're going to get data here for hanging weight and displacement. Over here, this is where you're going to plot hanging weight versus displacement. So you want to plot this column here versus this column here and essentially what you should get is you should get a straight line which would probably make a graph that looks something like this All right so if you fit that slope that gives you your force constant value now if we look at our formulas once you have k you can get the period of a spring from K if you know what the mass is hanging off of it. So in the second part of the lab right here, I think you're told to put 200 grams on it. And then what we want to do is we want to calculate what the theoretical period is. And then we're going to stretch it down, release it, and see what the actual period is. So based on the fact that I have like a 200 gram mass hanging off here, I should know what the theoretical period is. Now let's actually remove the damping because we don't want friction to be involved here. You can solve for the theoretical value of period in seconds based on the value of K you get for this spring. And in addition to that, uh, based on the uh, weight that you have hanging off the spring. Keep in mind, this has to be in kilograms. This is 200 grams, that would be 0.2 kilograms. But what you're gonna do is you're going to stretch it and allow it to oscillate up and down. Now we want to time its period. I would tell you probably best to go 10 times as opposed to just trying to do one, but let's just, once it hits, let's say the apex of uh, its motion here, I'm gonna hit the play button. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. And if you look, that, yeah looks pretty good about 10.39 seconds for 10 full oscillations so if I divide that by 10 that would be my period there so I could put my expected period here my measured period which I just measured here based off of that I can calculate the frequency of my uh, spring and then what we're told to do is let's experiment with different levels of stretching so I stretch it a certain distance down why don't we go a little bit farther and see if this affects anything. So if I do it again, it would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 
10. I can get my period off there if you take a look here. Not much difference. It would be 10.38 divided by 10 would be my period there. And in the third part of the experiment, you're going to basically do the same thing. Um, but what we're going to do is change the mass of the system. So essentially, I think, you know, the directions tell you to do 500. That's not an option here. It was in the old one. Um, so I would tell you just to do different numbers of mass between 50 and 300. And then you can fill in the boxes. You got well, about five boxes to fill in. So, you know, I would say maybe it just makes sense to do like 50, 100, 150, 200, 250, 300. And then essentially you're done here. In this part here. If you take a look at the formulas again, you can see that period is not linearly related to mass here. As the mass changes, the period should change. But what you have to do is you have to plot t versus the square root of m. And what that's going to do is that would give you a linear plot. So once you square root the m data, um, you should then get a graph that's linearized. If the data looks good, it's going to look something like this. You fit the slope of that, do the rise over the run, and your slope what it's equal to, it's equal to that value right there. Eh, I don't want that to blank out. No fill. Um, 2 pi over square root of k. So if I rearrange that, my k value would be 4 pi squared over the slope squared. And I want to compare this k value to what we got in the first part here. Just to see if it all worked out. If it's anywhere close, that's a very good sign. Right, the second part is the pendulum part of the experiment. So let's get out of masses and springs and type in FET pendulum. And again, I would expect it to be first result here. What we're going to do is we're going to do something similar here, only we're going to have something different oscillating here. So go to the lab and essentially um, what we can do is in the first part of the experiment, part one, what we're told to do is choose a mass and then also we'll choose a length of the pendulum and essentially when we do that we can Pull it back. Now, I would say for the sake of simplicity, we're not going to really want to go beyond the 15 degree mark. It's not going to be a big deal, but you, you do, will get more errors as you go way out. So, you know, 15 is where there's very short errors. 20 degrees, you'll get a little bit of error, but let's just let it go back and forth. And what we have here is something that's oscillating back and forth. Now, based on the formulas that you were given, if you have the length then you should know the period of the pendulum. So we can calculate the expected period of our pendulum based off the length alone. We know that the value of G is 9.81. And then what we'll do here is we'll measure the period here as well. So there should be a stopwatch. Where is it? Period timer right here. And it actually just does it for you. You don't have to sit there and, and do it. I guess you, if you use this stopwatch, you would have to do multiple oscillations to get it more accurate. So this is actually a neat little tool here that will give you the period. And what you want to do is at some point you want to experiment with different angles in this part. So I actually don't remember what angle I did. So I'll just go to a farther angle. And it's going to get me my period just based off of that. Um, and then if you take a look at the rest of the part here, what we're asked to do is we're asked to keep the angle of release at 10 degrees but now we're going to change the length so we'll do that for a set amount of mass that's going to change the period each time you're going to measure it each time again you can always calculate the frequency if you have the period because frequency is one over the period but again what you when you go down here when you look at this relationship right here the period is not directly proportional to length so you wouldn't get a linear plot plotting t versus l but if you plot t versus the square root of l you will get a linear plot so what we'll do is do that and then when you fit the line your slope is going to be equal to 2 pi over g so if i rearrange that if we say 4 pi squared and divide it by the slope squared that's going to get us our value of g and if it gets anywhere close to 9.81 we are in good shape here so hopefully this video helps you 
navigate through this simulation a little bit more, uh, please email me if you still are having trouble with it. But let's see how you guys do.